This video introduces isoparametric elements. Isoparametric elements are an element type where we define the element in a local coordinate system and then we transform it to a global coordinate system. We've done that before with bar and beam elements, but now with isoparametric, it's a particular type of transformation. Specifically, if you look at the term there, iso means same and parametric is related to the parameters that define our element. So the specifically an isoparametric element is going to use the same shape functions that are used to interpolate displacement and we're going to use those shape functions to do a mapping from our local coordinate system to our global coordinate system. Before we get into isoparametric elements, let's quickly review what our options are for element transformation. What we have is elements that we need in 2D space and we have a global coordinate system. So one option we have is that we define every single element directly in the global system. The benefit of that is we don't need to worry about transformation at all. Everything's done with the global coordinate system. However, every four-sided figure has a different shape in the global coordinate system. Well, not every. Every square is still a square, but we have a lot of non-square four-sided figures that show up in a typical mesh and every single one of those will need its own definition in the global system. We even have to get new definitions for rotated squares, diamond shapes, for example. It can be done, this process of defining the element properties directly in the global system can be done for three-noted or triangular elements, and it works very successfully for those. But four-sided has dramatic shape changes that require a different definition for every new type of shape that the four-sided figure can form into. So the alternative is to define the elements in some sort of local system and then transform them to the global system in order to do the calculations. That is by far easier, even though the transformation, as you're going to see, gets a little bit messy, it's far easier because we have one definition for every four-sided figure then. So we get that simple, single, simple definition, but we have a transformation challenge. So we're going to have to define some sort of mathematical mapping between our local system and our global system. That is how most four-sided figures are, are, um, are mapped, are um, transformed. We're also going to see that for most um, three-dimensional elements as well. Before we get into how we map from a local coordinate system to a global, let's focus in on that local coordinate system. For isoparametric elements, instead of talking about a local coordinate system, we call it the natural coordinates for an element. And here what I've shown is the bilinear quadrilateral element in its natural coordinate system. I'm going to call that coordinate system S and T. Some other authors will use a, a different uh, set of variables here, but it's basically just not the global XY system. Just like for the bilinear quadrilateral we did previously, the axes are centered in the middle of the element, but now the element has a fixed size. It is two units tall and two units wide, and the node numbering is as shown. So previously, when we looked at the bilinear quadrilateral, it had a width of 2B and a height of 2H, and here were the shape functions for that element. Now what we're going to do is convert that by setting B and H equal to 1, so we have a standard size, and then we're going to take our, S and turn, our X and turn it to an S, and our Y and turn it to a T. That gives us our new shape functions defined in terms of the natural coordinates S and T. So now let's talk about how we map from that natural coordinate system over to our global XY coordinate system. So we start out in the natural system with this basic square element two by two dimensions. And what we want to do is map to a global system where we have an element, say, that looks like this, where we have some nodes assigned to the corners, but it's no longer a square shape. What we're trying to do is relate these two shapes to each other so that we can do things in the natural coordinate system that's consistent between every element, but the properties will be relevant in the global. So here in the global system, each one of these nodes has nodes numbers, x1, y1, x2, y2, and so on, that each node there, we need to have some correspondence from node one in global, 
with coordinates of x1, y1, back to node 1 in the natural with coordinates of negative 1, negative 1. We need to define a transformational mapping that gives us the x coordinate for every corresponding s and t coordinate, and similarly gives us the y coordinate for every s and t coordinate. That means we can basically map on the grid corresponding to the natural coordinate system within this single element. That's fundamentally what we're trying to do here. Put the S and T coordinate system somewhat warped inside this element. When we do this mapping with something called an isoparametric element, what we're going to use is the elements shape functions previously defined for displacements, we're going to use them to map the position from natural to global. So let's get started on that mapping. What I've got shown here is the um, interpolation within the, um, the natural coordinate system of the displacements. So I have the n1, n2, n3, and n4 defined in terms of the natural coordinates s and t. And then I've got u defined there as well. So this, we know this definition. That's how we find displacement um, from degrees of freedom. It's the interpolation function. So displacement inside the element given by the relationship between the nodal displacements and the shape functions. What we want to do is now find the positions inside an element. In other words, x and y in terms of the nodal positions. So we're going to write a relationship written in matrix form as the vector x positions in the element is equal to the shape function matrix multiplied by a vector of nodal positions rather than a vector of nodal displacements. So in other words, this is what we are writing as our mapping system. We're reusing those same shape functions, but now we're multiplying them by the positions of each of the nodes in the global system instead of multiplying by them the displacements of each of the nodes. So that gives us the, the full matrix form is we have a vector of the nodal positions. x1, y1 is the position of node 1 in global coordinates. x2, y2 is position of node 2 in global coordinates and so on. And then we have our shape function matrix, the exact same one we're going to use for displacements. Um, but remember, it is now defined in terms of the natural coordinate system, S and T. So let's explore this mapping just a little bit more. We have what I'm calling a little x vector. That is the positions, x and y. It's going to be equal to a shape function matrix that's defined in terms of the position in my um, natural coordinate system. And then I'm multiplying it by a vector, which is all of the nodal positions in the global coordinates. So I'm mapping from the global over to the local or vice versa. It gives us a one-to-one -one correspondence. So there's one point in the natural coordinate system. It will have a corresponding point in the global system. And the reason that this helps us out is that we can define our shape function matrix, which we already have in natural coordinates, but we can also define our B matrix that way. And we need to do some mapping. We need to take advantage of the mapping in order to do that. We'll see that in a moment. Secondly, once we have the B matrix, we then need to calculate the stiffness matrix. To calculate the stiffness matrix means integrating over the element. Every element in global coordinates has a different shape. Integrating over each of those would be very complicated to try to code. But instead, if we can use the mapping to do our integration in the natural coordinate system, well, that's very easy. We're going negative 1 to 1 in x and y, and then we're done. So those are the two real benefits we get out of doing this mapping. Okay, so let's work on finding that B matrix. It starts to get a little bit hairy here, so hang on tight. Um, we know that B is going to be the partial derivative matrix operator multiplied by the shape function matrix, or in long form, that looks like this. But we need to know the derivatives with respect to X and Y because that's how strain is related to displacement. That's where this came from, the strain displacement relationship. However, the shape functions are now defined in terms of our natural coordinate system. So in other words, what we're looking for is the derivative of, say, n1 with respect to x, but n1 is defined with respect to s and t. So what we're looking for are the derivatives of the shape functions with respect to x and y. Let's try the chain rule. 
For example, dNi, let's say i is 1, 2, 3, or 4, we'll, um, dNi dx is going to be equal to dNi ds times ds dx plus dNi dt times dt dx. That would be the chain rule expansion of the derivative dNi dx. Similarly for dNi dy, we have a similar relationship. So that's the chain rule expansion. How does that help us? Well, you'll see in just a moment. Um, let's write this in matrix form because, hey, it's FEA and that's what we do. Uh, so dNi dx, dNi dy becomes a vector and it's going to be equal to a matrix which has the four coefficients in there. So ds dx, dt dx, ds dy, and dt dy. Notice that this is a, each one of these terms is the derivative of the mapping, the x to t or y to t, um, s to t coordinate system. That, of course, is all going to be multiplied by my shape function derivatives, which I can now solve for because shape functions are defined directly in terms of s and t. So if we can figure out what's in that matrix, we can calculate the derivatives of the shape functions with respect to x and y, which means we can then go and find b. But we know the vector with the shape functions. We don't know the derivatives of the natural coordinates with respect to the global. Remember, our mapping is um, x defined in terms of s and t, so we don't have the inverse. Let's temporarily call that matrix that we don't know j minus 1, the inverse of j. So this is the inverse of j. Why the inverse? Well, let me show you. So j is something we call the Jacobian matrix. J inverse is something we've just defined. It's the partial derivatives of s and t with respect to x and y, something that we don't know. On the other hand, j is something that we do know, and I'll show you how we get there. So first off, let's take that expression and we'll multiply both sides by the Jacobian j, in other words, the inverse of the one we just saw. And when I do that, I get dn ds dn dt is equal to the Jacobian times dn dx and dn dy. So now I have the thing that I don't know on the right hand side multiplied by something else that at the moment I don't know and it's equal to the thing that I do know. Not normally the relationship that we'd like to use uh, but it's going to be helpful to us. Let's go ahead and write out the um, chain rule expansion of the two terms in the left hand vector. So dn ds is equal to dn dx times dx ds plus dn dy times dy ds. Similarly, we have a, a relationship like that for dn dt, a chain rule expansion. When I take that and I write it in matrix form, the left vector looks the same as what's above. The matrix ends up being each of those coefficients again, but now these are things that we know. dx ds and dy ds are defined, um, can be directly calculated from our mapping. And then that's multiplied by, again, the vector that we don't know. But by comparison of these two right-hand equations, we can see I have just defined what the Jacobian is equal to. It is four terms, which are the derivatives of my global coordinates with respect to my natural coordinates. Is your head hurting yet? Uh, <laughs> This actually works. It makes sense. It's a little bit to, a little bit difficult to grasp. So um, let's take it a step further, kind of bring it all home. How do we get to B with this information? One of the first things that we want to observe is that if we can calculate J, it's a two by two matrix. We can find the inverse of it once we calculate it. So that's how we're going to end up going back to that upper left equation here which is going to allow us to get those derivatives with respect to x and y that we need to have in the B matrix. So now we have a definition of a Jacobian matrix. It is the partial derivatives of global with respect to local coordinates. So the matrix that we then need to find ni derivative with respect to x and ni derivative with respect to y is the inverse of that Jacobian and because it's a two by two, it has a simple definition for the inverse. So J inverse is defined here. 
We can use that to find each of these partial derivative components of B. Specifically, what we're going to do is for each of our shape functions, 1, 2, 3, and 4, we're going to take the derivative with respect to x or the derivative with respect to y. That's what we're looking for. We don't know those. Um, they're going to be equal to the Jacobian inverse multiplied by the shape, derivative of the shape function with respect to s and t, the natural coordinate systems, which they are ref defined in terms of. So there's a lot more here that we're going to explore in the next video. Just to wrap this up, I'm going to talk about a couple of properties of this Jacobian matrix we just created. So first off, note that it, its terms are the derivatives of the global coordinates with respect to the natural coordinate system. So it effectively is that transformation matrix. It's capturing all the pertinent information about our mathematical mapping. Another interesting property is that when we take the determinant of j, that's a scale factor. It is actually equal to the ratio of the elements area in global coordinates to the element area in natural coordinates. So ratio as in a fraction. We will use this property. It'll be critical when we find the uh, stiffness matrix by integration. Another interesting point is that when we have a high quality element, that determinant j is a constant term. So when we have an element which is a rectangle, j is constant. However, if j is not constant, in other words, it depends on position, then the numerical integration that we're going to use to find the stiffness matrix is not going to be exact. It will be an approximation. That's going to be important in the next video. Also, if the determinant is not constant, we can use the ratio of the maximum determinant divided by the minimum, I'm sorry, the minimum divided by the maximum to assess the degree of element quality. And specifically, a good rule of thumb is that the minimum should be at least 70% of the maximum. In other words, it's close to constant. And then we can say we have a good quality or a good shaped element.